Welcome again to another time in the presence of God to hear the Word of God. Let's go before the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come before you. Thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for what you will do momentarily. Thank you for the word of God and for all that it is doing and will do in our lives today. Thank you that we're saved by the precious blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you for the great mighty one, the Holy Ghost, who has been sent to be our teacher and our guide to unveil the living word through the written word. In the name of Jesus, I trust the Holy Ghost right now to live big in me, to think through my mind, and speak through my lips make my tongue as it were the pen of a ready writer that I might speak as of the oracles of God thank you for what this word will do in us for us and to us and even through us as we yield thank you Lord that not one person who hears this word will be the same after hearing this word. We give you praise and glory in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for lifting heavy hearts, for healing sick bodies. Praise God. And for delivering people that are bound. Oh, we give you praise for it all. In the mighty and majestic name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. Without further ado, we're going to get right into some things that I believe is going to bless you. I'm really excited about the word today because I've been thinking about it for several weeks anticipating that I was going to teach this. And uh, so I wanted you to, and I'm sure you're going to be excited about it once you get a hold of it, because it has the ability to change your whole life and change the course of your life. Thank God for understanding. The entrance of his word gives life. You know, it gives understanding to the simple. I want to say something and then we'll get right into it. I was saying something to the Lord this morning because if you think about some of the things we talked about in the past couple of weeks, I was thinking this morning about how what ministers do today in the church world, leader, church leaders and others, not just leaders, but others. How many times we put the word of God aside, we dismiss it, and we say things such as, well, the Lord led me to do this. And we will ignore what the Bible says and now say, but I understand this, it says that, but the Lord just led me to do it like this. God can never, ever lead you to do anything that's inconsistent with the holy written word of God. Praise God. So having said that, I want you to lift your Bibles with me and say with me, this is my Bible. It is the word of God. It is God speaking to me. 
His purpose is to bless me, to change me, and to be glorified through my life. Therefore, I set myself in agreement with his word by having a receptive heart and a readiness of mind to receive. And by being a doer of the word I hear, not a hearer only, I realize that obedience to God's word is essential in order to have God's best for my life. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And I'm going to be reading verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. It reads, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. We've been talking for the past couple of weeks about distinguishing the voice of the Lord. And I brought out some things that the Lord revealed to me about moves that were made and how he explained to me that those moves was not his plan. And today I'm going to show you a couple of things, but before we get into what I want to show you, in relation to that, because I want to kind of deal with the, the, the danger of leaning to your own understanding, particularly in connection with being led by the Spirit of God. And I want to show you today how that you can have a call of God on your life, or there's a particular will that God has for you, and you are aware of what he asked for you or what he wants you to do. But that in itself is not enough. It's one thing to know what he, wa what he wants you to do, what he called you to do, and so forth. But it's a whole other thing to know the plan. And some people make the mistake of thinking that if I know, for instance, particularly with a call, there are people who know that they are called of God, let's say, to, uh, to preach or into the min in ministry. And they're, in their own understanding, they think, well, the next best thing to do is to go to school and study and learn things to prepare myself for the ministry. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. And while that is partially true, I mean, it is true that you should be preparing yourself. The problem is that they come up with their own plan. I'm going to do this, and then I'm ready. But like the old song said, it ain't necessarily so. Now, before I go into it, let's go over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians, praise God, chapter 10. The Lord is good, isn't he? He is. He is good. I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. I want you to pay attention, uh, close attention to what the Word of God is saying. And you'll see in a few minutes why I chose this particular passage. Moreover, brethren, 
I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank, drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Now listen, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. That still happens. People get overthrown in the wilderness. The wilderness represents the things that they go through and have to deal with, and all of these kinds of things, trials and tests and other things. That's your wilderness. And some people get overthrown in the wilderness. Now, verse 6, listen, now these things, were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now I want you to hear this verse, verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. I'll go one more verse. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. It's Interesting to me that God put all of these things in the scriptures and the trials and things that happened with the children of Israel so that we can learn something from it. That's the point I wanted you to see. God wants us to learn from the mistakes of those others. Hallelujah. We ought to be able to learn something. You should never open your Bible without having the attitude of God teaching you something from that word. So I'm going to deal with the, the danger of being led by your own understanding. We're going to start off by reading a couple of passages of Scripture. Let me say again. It is not enough to know the will of God for your life. It's important also to know the plan. Go with me to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15. I find this extremely interesting. Not only this verse, but these things that we're going to be talking about today. Genesis 15 and verse 13. Let's start at verse 12. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he, speaking of the Lord, 
said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed, in other words, his descendants, shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Now the Lord is speaking to Abraham, who was called Abram at the time, and tells him something about the future that's going to happen with his descendants in the future. And he said, they are going to be, and, and these people are what we call the Israelites that came from him. And the Lord says that they're going to go into bondage. Now God has his purposes and reasons for everything that he causes or even allows to take place. And if you study the scriptures carefully, you'll find that Israel suffered most of the time because of their disobedience, ignoring God, turning away from God, and those kinds of things. And the Lord said, now, know of a surety, this is surely going to happen, that your seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for hundred years. How many years the Lord say they're going to be afflicted? Four hundred years. Now, turn with me to the book of Exodus. Exodus. Uh, chapter 12. Now, I'm going to ask you something as you turn to Exodus 12. Uh, can the Lord count? Does he know what 400 years is? Surely he does. Amen. Amen. So here in Exodus 12, we're going to begin at verse, well, we're going to read verse 40 and 41. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was... 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Now these are God's people who God told Abraham many years earlier Uh, that uh, these people are going to be in bondage for 400 years. And here we see that instead of them being in bondage for 400 years, as the plan of God said, as the word of God said, and by the way, the Lord didn't say around 400 years. He didn't say about 400. He said 400 years. I ask again, does he know how to count? So he said 400 years. So if the Lord said they're going to be in bondage 400 years, what happened? Why is it that they were bound for... 30 years longer than God said. The plan of God was for the Israelites to be in bondage 
How many years? Talk to me. 400 years according to what we read in Genesis 15, 13. But the Israelites spent an extra 30 years in bondage. Now let's look at why. Why in the world did that happen? And in order to get the answer, I want you to turn with me in the book of Acts. Book of Acts. You said, we're going to find an answer to that in Acts? Absolutely. In the book of Acts. Thank God for the word. I said, thank God for the word. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. I'm going to start reading at verse 11. Now there came a dearth all over, over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren. And Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. Hallelujah. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died. He and our fathers. And were carried over into Sychem. And laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money. Of the sons of Amor, the father of Sychem. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children, to the end, they might not live. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. You know, when I read this, I say, what is this nonsense Moses told the Lord when the Lord wanted to send him? He said, Lord, I, I can't talk. You know, I can't. What, what, what are you talking about? Making excuses trying to get God not to send them. Because Moses was mighty in words and in deeds. Now notice this. And when he was full 40 years old, see, God does everything according to his own calendar. God waited until Moses was 40 years old. before he began to deal with him in the manner that he did. What did he do? When he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Who put that in his heart? God. God put it in Moses' heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. That's God put it in his heart. Moses knew who he was. 
Listen, he knew the will of God. He knew that God was going to use him as the deliverer. He already knew that. He knew the will of God. He was called to be the deliverer. He knew his calling. But let's see what he did. And seeing one of them suffer, verse 4, 24 says, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. He killed the Egyptian. Listen to what verse 25 says. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. What did Moses do here? He leaned on his own understanding. He had knowledge of the call. He had knowledge of what God's purpose, his purpose was. But he didn't have the plan. He didn't know the plan. And he didn't wait on the plan. He got emotion, emotional. How many people today make decisions based primarily on their emotions? But what's worse is how many people do that and then claim the Lord led them? Because they're not true to themselves. All right, now let's go on. He supposed. See, in his mind, oh, they're going to realize I'm the one. But they didn't understand that. Moses knew who he was, but they didn't know who he was. And the next day, he showed himself unto them as they strove. In other words, they were having some battle with each other and would have set them at one again, saying, sirs, you're brethren. Why did you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away. He pushed Moses aside, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Well, really, God did, but you don't know yet. Will thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? So now Moses is exposed. He thought his thing was hidden. But it wasn't. Then fled Moses at this saying. Moses said, uh oh, I'm in trouble now. I got to get out of here. I killed an Egyptian. I was raised in Pharaoh's house. I got I to gotta get out of here. And he ran. Then Moses fled at the saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begat two sons. Now get this. And when what? Forty years were expired. They appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee to Egypt. 
This Moses, whom they refused, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge. The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. Here's what I want you to see. When it comes to the plan of God, you can't rush it. There is no shortcut. When it comes to the call of God and when you should be going forth, there's no shortcut. But you can do some things to prolong it. Here we see something was prolonged. Now, the first thing that happened, because Moses was leaning to his own understanding and acted out of his emotion, he lost 40 years. He was 40 years old when God put in his heart to go to see his brother. And his emotions cost him 40 more years. Sometimes that happens with people today, including preachers, people with a call. They're in a hurry trying to rush God, trying to make it happen according to their own understanding. They figure, well, there's enough time now. I should have been doing this by now. Really? The problem is you don't know the plan. And you're going by your own clock. You know, the Bible teaches that it's not in man to direct his own steps. You don't have, you know, you're not smart enough. You're not knowledgeable enough. You don't know enough. Hallelujah. You can't shorten God's plan, but you can lengthen it by leaning to your own understanding. And that's what happened with Moses. Now you stop and think. So now he comes to him, to, to these Israelites, to visit them, see something going on that's not right, take it upon himself and move in his own flesh to remedy the situation. Came up with the wrong idea kill somebody in the process, and now you got to go run for your life. And now it's going to take God 40 years of you working in the wilderness, 40 years of you learning some things there. Sometimes people take steps, and then the ministry they thirsting for gets delayed. Or they go out anyway, and it don't, they don't, nothing much, much of it because they went and weren't sent. And, and you can't go find some stranger to ordain you so you can say you, you were sent out. You're lying. And that's just all to it. That's a lie. You went and weren't sent. You just found somebody that's a fake sending. You are a stranger. I don't know you from Adam's house cat, as my grandmama used to say. You don't know me. Amen. And you know, I can't accuse anybody of doing anything that I don't know, so I'm not, I'm not going to accuse anybody of doing anything. But I know preachers, and many of them, you know, get excited if somebody's going to sow into their church into their ministry. And I know sometimes people use their money to manip manipulate. Oh, I didn't accuse anybody of anything. I'm just talking about what does go on in the world, in the church world. It happens. Amen. Praise God. I wouldn't be surprised right now. You can go online somewhere and uh, get a license or ordination for a nice fee. 
Amen. And people do those kinds of things. But that doesn't make it God, and it doesn't mean God sent you, you know, got yourself ordained, got yourself licensed, got yourself sent by some stranger. That's, that's not real. Amen. You know, over the past few years, uh, there's a, there's been a, a thing, you know, that uh, President Trump started saying. He started calling some of these news media outlets fake news. And that became a big thing. People are fake news. Well, we got fake sending. Fake anointing, fake being sent out, fake everything. Oh Lord, let me, I'm going to get off of that. But now, you know, I'm going to show you something else. The Lord brought this to me a few weeks ago. I want you to go over to 1 Samuel. The Lord brought this over to me, and I'm going to come back and talk some more about our friend here. <laughs> but the Lord brought this to me a few weeks ago. I was sitting in, in my car, sitting outside the grocery store, supermarket. Sitting, in, and I was in this park, I was parked, and the Lord brought this to me, and he said, this is a case of Israel leaning to their own understanding. They did the same kind of thing. Did I tell you where to go? Huh? First Samuel chapter 8. First Samuel chapter 8. Listen carefully. We're going to start at verse 1. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second Abiah. They were judges in Bathsheba. But there was a little problem. His sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre. I mean, after money. And took bribes and perverted judgment. Now, these are the judges. They're in position as judges. but they are corrupt. They were corrupt. Now, we see that. It is true that they were corrupt, right? Here's the problem. Sometimes you're faced with something and you see, well, this is not right. That's not right. But what does that mean for you? Does that mean then you have the right to come up with your own plan on how to handle it? I'm talking to somebody. Now, here's what happened. The elders, all the elders of Israel, see, they got themselves together. And they said, well, listen, let's go to, to, to Ramah, to Samuel. You see, God did not deal with the people individually. He dealt with the prophets. And the people heard from God through the prophets. 
So God didn't deal directly with them. He would deal with the prophets. And they came to Samuel and they told him, listen, behold, when you see that word behold, that means take notice. You, thou art old. You are old now. And your sons are not walking in your ways. They don't do like you did. Now, we got a solution. Make us a king to judge us like all the nations. See, their own, they lean to their own understanding. In their mind, the answer to, doing, to dealing with this, the corruption, was, well, to be like other people. We want to be like other nations. But God didn't deal with Israel like he dealt with other nations. He didn't deal, or let me say it the other way. He didn't deal with other nations like he dealt with Israel. And knowing that, the thing, the Bible says, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. Sometimes people ask for things, even ask God for things, they don't realize what they're asking for. Amen. And what did Samuel do? He didn't do a Dana Holmes or some of the other. Get out of my face. He went to the Lord. He prayed. Now, Dana Holmes would have went to the Lord too. But he still might have said, get out of my face. But anyway. Anyway. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. So Samuel is going to God saying, look what they're coming to me saying. Look, Lord, they came to me with their own plan. They don't want it to stay the way it is because of my corrupt sons. But Samuel knew God well enough to know that God, in his own time, and in his own way, would have dealt with those boys. Sometimes we take it upon ourselves to do things that's God's business. So here's what God said. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. Now why is the Lord saying, telling him, go ahead and do it. Do whatever they ask you to do. Why is God telling Samuel to hearken to these people? Is it because it's his will? No. Is it because this is the best way to go? No. But why? He said, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me. That I should not reign over them. Look at that. This is not a rejection of you. It's a rejection of me. Hey, if God plants you someplace and you say, I'm out of here, you're not reject. That's not just a rejection of that church or pastor. That's a rejection of God if he planted you. Oh, they're not like that, Lord. Now, he says in verse 8, according to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now, therefore, hearken unto their voice, how be it, yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king, that he shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for, yourself, for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. 
and he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. Now when that happens, you're going to cry out in that day because of your king which you shall have chosen you and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Listen to this. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us. Some people, no matter what words you give them, no matter what you say, no matter what you tell them, Amen. Brother came to speak to me after he had made a decision about his life. The decision had already been made. The announcements had been made. Whatever else, things had already been set into place. And then he asked me, what do you think? The first thing was, it matter what I think? That, not, that wasn't a genuine question. Sometimes, what do you think? I just want to see. They won't say all of this. I just want to see if, if, if you will agree with me. And if you don't, I'm going to do it anyway. Because I know God told me. They won't, you see, all that won't be said. Verbalized. It'll just be acted out. But since you asked me, you said the Lord said, well, if you knew the word, you would know that it is impossible for God to have led you to do this this way, if you knew the word. Nay, but we will have a king. <laughs> Nay, but I will go do the work of the Lord. It's amazing to me how people do stuff on their own and call it God's work. Are you serious? And see, they were worn and they suffered. They, they was a, a real serious problem, but they came up with their own solution. It's not in man to direct his own step. They should have sought God. Remember what we opened up with? Lean not to your own. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct your path. Instead of going to the man of God telling him, this is what we want. They could have sought God by going to him. Please seek God and tell us what shall we do. Hallelujah. I came up under a mighty man of God. And in my opinion, he's always going to be that to me. Praise God. I didn't say a perfect human. I said a mighty man of God. And he was my father in the faith. I don't mean just somebody I'm calling my father. He's my father. I recognize who he is. If that man, Apostle, the late, great Apostle Arturo Skinner, if that man ever told me 
that something I was about to do, I shouldn't? I mean, I'm going to put the brakes on so fast, my head going through the windshield. I mean, that's it. That's going to be a slam on the brake. Amen. Praise God. Because I'm not going, I don't want to take any steps. The Bible tells me to obey them that have the rule over I have to recognize. You can't obey somebody that have a rule over you without recognizing they have rule over you. But some of these folk, ain't nobody got rule over them. God or anybody else. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going somewhere. I'm, I'm almost through in a few more minutes. Hallelujah. But this is good stuff. Because of my respect, but when you lose your respect, you won't listen. Remember what the Lord said? <clears throat> said to me, and I told you, two weeks in a row, he would not receive correction from you because the position that you held in his heart and in his life had changed. So, when that happens, and that's why the enemy does that. The enemy is always after the word. And he's always after the one that brings the word. Amen. I remember the Lord said to me, he said, uh, just several years ago, he said, there are those who will stand with you through thick and thin. And there are those who become weary and faint because their expectations are disappointed. That's a powerful word right there. Hallelujah. But anyway, my man of God could not tell me anything, and I argue. Somebody said, what if you really thought the Lord, what if you knew God told you? Well, if I knew God told me, I know God can tell him. Yeah, all right. All right, Lord, now. Did you? All right, good. You told me to obey them that have the rule over me. So I'm going to my man of God who has the rule over me. And if he says no, then praise the Lord, hallelujah. I'm obeying your word then you have to deal with him. It's that simple. I'm, I'm, I'd rather obey God than man. Man, please. You wouldn't know God if you met him in the middle of the street. Wearing a red hat with God written on it. Still wouldn't recognize it. On green day. Now I want to go back to something. Because I want you to see. Let's look at what happened. The Lord said they would be in bondage 400 years. Moses leans to his own understanding, takes a step that caused him to lose 40 years. Now, while Moses is in the wilderness 40, way, 40 years, what's going on in Egypt? They're still there. They're still there. Now, by the time the Lord came to Moses when he was 40 years old, now, 
Now, 430 years have passed. Which means that if you look at it, Moses must have done this thing in year 390. If Moses would have sprayed himself because he had ants in his pants, if he would have not gone that way, waited 10 more years, then the plan of God would have unfolded. But instead of him waiting 10 more years, he did something in the flesh, had to go away 40 years and cause them to suffer 30 more years. I'm talking about the danger of being led by your own understanding. Lean not to your own understanding. You may know you called of God. What's the plan? You know, I remember years ago, I wanted to go to a school at Ramah. And uh, the Lord dealt with me and said, you can't go. And you're going to have to get on the job training. And, uh, I accepted that at the time, but I didn't, it wasn't settled, I just accepted. Sometimes we accept things, but it ain't really settled with us. That's why we keep messing with it, keep pecking at it, keep tasting. Amen. Like, like putting something on the table, and you got a little kid that said, don't touch this. Walk out the room. And they go, they, they all around the table looking. They're curious, boy. So one day, Brother Hagen had a, he was down in, um, I think, Miami or North Miami Beach or something, doing a meeting, and I went. And I had an opportunity to speak to him. While he was standing up there after service, I just walked up to him and started talking to him. And I said, you know, I let him know who I'm a pastor and this, that, and the other. I said, I've been thinking about going to, you know, coming to rain. What do you think? Even though at the time we was in North Carolina, I said, what do you think about me coming to, you know, Raymond? He said, what? he said, how that work? He said, uh, his first words were, I doubt it very seriously. Then he said, but then, um, <clears throat> on the other hand, we have the pastor. We have a, well, he's a pastor. And then he comes, you know, and he goes home on the weekend. He said, but then on the other hand, he's, he's a, right there in Texas. But then, they do have airplanes. He all over the place. Then he tapped me on the shoulder. Well, you just, well, you pray and seek the Lord. See what he tell you. <laughs> I knew I was in trouble. I went back to that hotel room, and all the walls closed in. Seemed like it. The Lord said, he said, I told you that that's not what you are to do. And you're going to go ask a man what he thinks. And thankfully, he answered the way he did. I mean, I wasn't going no way because the Lord wasn't going to let that happen anyway. But I had an idea, but it wasn't God's plan. I would have enjoyed it, but well, still wasn't God's plan. <clears throat> I would have got something out of it. It wasn't God's plan. It's not just about if you're going to enjoy it, if you're going to get something out of it. Is it his 
plan. Well, I don't know. Well, stand still until you find out. Now, let me just tell you this one last thing. I was a, in a group of, with a, a part of a group of ministers in the city, and we came together and had discussions about different things, and we did a couple of things together, put on a, something and invited a speaker in. We did that. And so we kind of stayed in a meeting. Now, I was not the leader, but I don't have no problem. I don't have to be the leader of everything I'm a part of. So anyway, we were supposed to, we all had an assignment to pray over about something. We were looking for direction about something that we were to do. Because we were throwing ideas around. So let's pray. And we were going to come back and meet. And I remember when we came back to our meeting, the lead pastor said, well, I prayed and I didn't get nothing. And so I decided to do, and he said what he decided to do. And I said to myself, I can't follow this man across the street. Because he doesn't know how to hear from God and receive instruction. How are you going to follow something? I can't follow you. I mean, in this thing, I'll, I'll yield and submit. But I, I can't follow you. I mean, I, ain't, I didn't go tell him that. That's just the way I had inside of me. Because how in the world I'm going to follow somebody? How are you going to leave me and you don't know where you're going? Now, I expect some baby in Christ, somebody don't know much. You know, skip Sunday school and all that kind of stuff to come up with, I prayed I didn't get nothing, so I decided to do this or that. Excuse me. How old are you? Well, where are you in the Lord now? No. You find the plan. Well, well I'm going to do it now. Who cares? I, I feel, it's, I'm being pressed. I'm being pressed. Well, check it out. Demons drive. The Holy Ghost leads. Amen. I haven't seen anybody came to me being pressed. God told me, hey, I better do it and all that. I haven't seen it work yet. And I've had more than one foolish person to come tell me something like that. It wasn't God. And you can't make something be God just because you, you want it to be. Remember what we say, is you is or is you ain't? Y'all remember that? It's either God or not. You can't make it God. And you can't go in the corner and pout. Now, I'm out of time, but, and I'm not going to take a whole nother week to talk about. But you go over in Numbers and read over in the 13th chapter, you're going to find something that happened. That God led the Israelites a way that was not best for them. I mean, it wasn't the best way, but he led them the because of what was in them. Because they had the mentality, God knew, as soon as they see war, they're going to want to go back into Egypt. And I, when I looked at that, I said, wow, sometimes God leads people, not in the best way for them, but because of something in them. I don't know about you, but I want him to have his way Period. I don't care what I want. I don't care what I feel. I don't care how things look, taste, or smell. I want for me. I want the will of God. I don't want to do anything that's not his will. I mean nothing. I don't care if it'll make me rich. A gazillionaire. I wouldn't care what it is. 
I mean, how miserable are you going to be rich and out of God's will? My, my, my. Plus, you got to stand before him and give an account. Because you didn't do what he said when he said it. Praise God. By the way, you can't wake up one day and say, the Lord called me today to the ministry. No, he didn't. The call of God does not happen when you discover it. The call of God was made before the foundation of the world. You may have come into knowledge of it. March of 19 and so whatever. But that's not when he called you. Paul talks about that. God called him and separated him from his mother's womb. It pleased God to separate him then. So don't take steps with your life, with your ministry, if, if that's the case, or with your life. Because not everything is about ministry, even in your own life. Don't you want the will of God? Don't you want God's best? Then in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And if you praying and you didn't receive anything, then it ain't time to move on that. You understand what I mean by that? I'm not talking about move like you move to this city. Or that. I'm, not, I'm not talking about that. I mean, it would include that, but I'm talking about it's not time to take steps with your life. You understand that? I need to know. He got to show me. And I got to have his peace about what I'm doing. What's the plan? You know the call? Good. What's the plan? I don't know. Then you don't have your marching orders yet. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you again for what I think is a powerful word. It didn't come from me. And I want to thank you for the Holy Ghost. We started off a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, talking about distinguishing the voice of the Lord. And we covered many things, Lord. And today, we sort of brought it together. And I want to thank you for loving us enough and caring for us enough and looking out for us to show us what we need to know so that we don't be like blind men groping in the darkness, trying to feel our way, hoping that what we do is okay with you. Because, Father, as you know, many people, many, we do things and then we ask you to bless it. And we assume you should bless it, especially when it's something that we call the work of the Lord. especially church work or something along those lines, then we really think, well, I'm doing this for God. But may, may you help us to see you have a plan. And it's dangerous for us to lean to our own understanding and do our own thing. For it is not in man to direct his own steps. Thank you, Father, for all those that, that hear this word, both here today and those watch, watching on Facebook Live or YouTube, wherever they're watching. Thank you for ministering to your people 
and helping your people. Some are in trouble and in danger and don't know it. And may the Holy Ghost move on the hearts of people that's taking steps for them to stop and say, oh God, forgive me. I took a step without being ordered because the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Help me. Help us all. Lift your hands with me, everybody. How many of y'all want the will of God to be done? Say this with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the word I heard today. For I know that that word hath come from you for me. Forgive me if in any way I made steps that were inconsistent with your will or your plan. Help me today to know when you're leading me. Help me to know when you're guiding me. Help me to know when you're directing my steps according to your plan, according to your will, and according to your purpose for me. In the name of Jesus. Father, I ask you and I give you free calls to minister to me to work in my life, to help me know when to stop, to put on brakes, to go a different direction. Because in the end, I want to please you more than anything else or anyone else. I want to please you more than myself or anybody else. And I know that it's not in man to direct his own steps. And so I trust you. I trust the Holy Ghost to help me, to lead me, to guide me, to check me, to show me if I'm stepping wrong. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, I want to know your will like I know my name. I want to know it so well that if I were a wayfaring fool, I wouldn't err in it. That's how well I want to know it. Hallelujah. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now give them thanks. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise your holy name. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Perhaps someone out there watching or even in here have not come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. You know, there is a heaven to gain. And there is a hell to shun. There's only one way to be saved. And Jesus is that way. So if you're out there watching, right where you are, if you have not received the Lord as your Savior, you may be going to a church, singing on the choir, whatever. But if you have not received the Lord as your Savior, that's something you must do. Confess with your mouth that he is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. If you're ready 
do that now. Just slip up your hand and say with me, oh God, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I know that I cannot save myself. There is no other Savior but Jesus. I receive the Lord Jesus as my Savior, as my personal Savior, as my Lord, and as my only hope of eternal life. Hallelujah. And right now, I pass from death to life. In Jesus' name, I am saved. Now lift your hands and give him praise wherever you are. Right here, everybody, just lift your hands and thank him. Hallelujah. Praise God. God bless you. God bless you.